<laughs> the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the world's largest private charitable fund, giving $46 billion in grants since its founding in 2000 and literally saving millions of lives. The Microsoft co-founder came to Washington this week to make the case for American leadership and the need for foreign aid in the era of America first. When we sat down at the Chamber of Commerce, that's where we began. There was a recommendation by the executive branch uh, to make fairly substantial cuts uh, to the USAID budget. And uh, fortunately, the Congress took that proposal, which would have meant cutting people off from those HIV medicines, and they decided to maintain uh, the foreign aid levels. Your wife, Melinda, recently talked about, and I want to quote her directly, how incredibly disappointing it is to see U.S. leadership deteriorating and the view of the U.S. deteriorating because of some of the egregious things that have been said by this current administration. What's she talking about? Uh, I, I hope I know. Uh, <laughs> the, I think the particular uh, episode there was talking about Africa and the conditions in Africa in a uh, not in a in a positive way, sort of uh, characterizing the entire continent. But in any case, you talk about the blank countries, exactly. Um, and the U.S.'s engagement uh, in Africa and around the world. There are many reasons we should maintain that. Just a pure security point of view alone would justify this level of expenditure. Now, for many people, the humanitarian part of it uh, is also there, um, and, th and that part is dramatic. And so it is disappointing when it feels like the U.S. is being short-term and the U.S. is only thinking about its interests in a very narrow way and not being the leader that says, no, we you know, we are going to help these countries uh, get so that they can, can take care of themselves. The president's mantra is America first. You seem to be suggesting that in terms of America's interests, you've got to look a long way beyond America first. Well, I think that the broad definition of our interests, including investing in allies and not viewing every transaction as one that we have to maximize our benefit, taking you know, world institutions and have them just focus on the United States. What we did in terms of uh, the post-World War II institutions has been a fantastic thing. That included having a common view of the future with our Western allies. If you really follow that line of thinking, the idea of helping Africa uh, of working on an HIV vaccine to, to stop the AIDS crisis, you just wouldn't do it. And, and yet I feel, even in that narrow framework of, okay, I only care about what, how U.S. citizens do, even in that framework, these institutions, these alliances, these investments in innovation are overwhelmingly smart things to do. Since the year 2000, a billion people have lifted themselves from what you define as extreme poverty. And you say that the first wave was in China and the second wave was in India. Before we get to places where the wave hasn't hit yet, what happened in those places? One of the first things you want to do in these countries is raise agricultural productivity. Uh, all of the Asian miracles, uh, even going back to Taiwan and Japan, uh, South Korea, involved uh, more than tripling agricultural output per person so you could free up that labor and move it into the cities. And if you had the right uh, infrastructure, educational investment, then you've got a manufacturing sector of the economy and slowly but surely you'd get a very large middle class. You talk about the successes, the waves in China and, and in India, and then there's Africa. You say that by 2050, 86%, 86% of the extremely poor people in the world will live in Africa, and in fact, 40% will live in just two countries, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria. What's holding them back? 
is starting at very low levels of infrastructure, very low levels of poverty, and one of the things that drives those numbers you mentioned is the very high population growth. So they account for double the portions of births you'd expect. By the end of the century, the majority of births in the world will take place in Africa. Africa has to demand our attention. That's where extreme poverty uh, is still tough. That's where stability is uh, uh, difficult to achieve. And you know we've got to go after things like these neglected diseases, malaria. Uh, we've got to help them with infrastructure. Uh, it's really, in terms of our humanity of helping the poorest, Africa is where we'll be most tested. How do you even begin to address these concentrations of misery? Well, one of the great achievements um, in development history was what was called the Green Revolution, uh, where new varieties of the cereal crops, uh, corn, which uh, everyone else calls maize, uh, rice and wheat, in a period where people thought India would experience mass starvation because the agricultural output went up, they were actually able to improve the nutrition even uh, when their population was growing. We need to do that same thing for Africa. It seems that climate change could be the accelerant to all of the bad things in terms of, of uh, agricultural productivity, global health, uh, instability, extreme poverty. Talk about that. Yeah, for a country like the U.S. that's uh, northern, uh, you know, climate change will change things. We'll have more hot days, more forest fires, but it's not a threat to our survival. In Africa, where you are completely dependent on the rain coming, whereas there have been in the past about one out of 12 years you'll have a failed harvest, the prediction is that will be closer to one out of four years because of the higher temperature. And the, the unfortunately with climate change, you not only uh, is it uh, hotter, but the rain comes all at once or it doesn't come for long periods of time. So if you want to say, where are you going to get millions of deaths because of climate change between now and the end of the century, you don't look to the United States. Yes, you'll have some forest fires and there will be some deaths, but the, the significant numbers are in these very, very poor countries because of the subsistence farming. What do you say to those who say it's not climate change, it's weather, and that the, the, ma the human component is questionable? That's impressive. Uh, if somebody can say that out loud. Uh, the, the, uh, the have you, been to, have you been to Washington? <laughs> <laughs> the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is a super measurable thing. It's important not to overclaim what we know because that undermines the whole uh, discussion, but the general warming and the mechanism of that warming that has to do with uh, CO2 and, and methane emissions, that's, that's really not at question. I want to talk to you about toilets. Since 2011, the Gates Foundation has launched the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge. Explain one, why that's so important, and two, again, dealing with the specifics, what have been some of your successes and failures along the way? In many of these poor countries, the capital cost of building that sewer, it's just never going to happen. And so the solution would be to, instead of using that sewer, to have something in the toilet itself, which is essentially the processing facility. We had 10 different universities whose designs we funded, uh, so we put in several hundred million dollars. And now we've gotten it to the point where we have a lot of commercial companies to say, okay, that approach looks promising. Now the price of this toilet that, that does the processing is still 10 times more expensive. Uh, it's about you know, $10,000 uh, per toilet right now. We, to get it into these uh, tough parts, the, the slums of these African cities, we need it to be more like $1,000. I want to ask you about your, your old job. There's something of a, a backlash here in Washington against big tech. The growing feeling in Washington is that big tech does not do enough to protect users' privacy and that it shows political bias. 
Do you see merit in either of those arguments? I went through an episode in the late 90s uh, where Microsoft was subject to government investigation. Uh, we remember. And uh, <laughs> so in a way, this is, in a small way, now it's, it's, it's less Microsoft now, uh, but it, it's, it's broad. Yes, the government should be talking to these companies about what they do. There's nothing inappropriate. I was naive. I didn't have an office in Washington, D.C. Uh, I thought that was a good thing, and I even bragged about it. Uh, I later came to regret that. So these, I'm sure these guys are learning uh, better than I did, uh, that they need to come back here and, and start a dialogue, and there will be new types of regulation for these companies. And you don't have a problem with that? I mean, you well, think that's appropriate? The notion that there will be privacy regulation, that makes a lot of sense. The notion that the, this ability to identify anyone that we're going to think about how do businesses get to use that and how does the government use that, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense. Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft are right now jockeying for which is the, going to be the most highly valued company in the world in terms of market capitalization. At the close of the market on Friday, Microsoft was number one at over $800 billion, Apple $799.5 billion. <laughs> Does that give you any pleasure? You know, when I was starting Microsoft in my 20s, the idea that we could create a company that was, uh, you know, would beat IBM, you know, because they were the big uh, monolith, and you know, we understood software and they didn't, and we believed in these cute small machines to empower individuals, and they believed in these big machines. It was kind of mythic that we were going to beat IBM. By the time Microsoft valuation passed IBM, which is now, uh, you know, 15 years ago, it didn't feel like that big of a victory. Uh, and, and so you really, it's really better to define yourself by an aspiration. You know, can software improve education? Can software help you know, medical care costs in the U.S. just keep going up uh, dramatically? Can software pay, play a role there? So yes, I'm very proud of Microsoft uh, and the vision that software and technology would make a big thing. You know, it, it's led to the most valuable, the five most valuable companies uh, being these tech companies. So I do think it's a vindication of the importance of technology, which now is coming with a lot of responsibilities as well. Bill, it's an honor to talk to you again. Thank you. Great. And if you want to learn more about the remarkable work Bill and Melinda Gates are doing, you can find their link at foxnewssunday.com.